Hello and welcome to Rites Chapel. My name is Tanya. I'm the Director of Connection Ministries. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you haven't already, we'd like to ask you to type in your name and the name of those worshiping with you in the comment section. If you're worshiping with us today via YouTube, we're hoping that you will subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're worshiping with us today via Facebook, we're hoping that you will like and share today's service with others. As always, if you have questions about Rites Chapel or you'd like to learn more about its ministries, feel free to reach out to me directly at tanya at rightschapel.org. Again, thanks so much for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you as Clay leads us into a song of praise. Chapel. It is so good to be in worship with you this day. Uh, whenever it is that you are worshiping with us, we, we thank you for making time to worship God and pray that as you draw near to God, that you will feel that presence of God drawing near to you. My name is Charles. I'm pastor here at Rice Chapel. Thank you again for, for making time. Uh, I want to give a, a shout out to, to Les and Sandra Wade who've been sh uh, worshiping with us online. I know they've been uh, dealing with some family matters and have been out of out of town, but online worship been a great way for them to be able to connect with us and so glad to have them worshiping with us. I want to invite any of you who are worshiping with us online and in the area to stop by either during the week or stop by on a Sunday morning uh, and worship with us in person so that we can meet face to face. Uh, at the end of the service today, I hope that if, uh, if you found this service um, 
uh, helpful for you or inspiring or, or that you'll push the share button and uh, help us uh, spread the gospel with, with others. Just a, a, a quick announcement of uh, we are getting ready and preparing for our vacation Bible camp in July. And uh, you can sign up your children, grandchildren, neighbors, kids um, now. That's a real help to us if they, if they sign up beforehand as we get ready and prepare and, and get all the crafts and the fun that we're going to have together ready. So if you can sign up early, that's, that's a huge help. And you can do that with the QR code that's on your, on your screen. Uh, with that, uh, if you haven't checked in already, we want to invite you to check in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. And, and um, you can do that simply by typing your name and the names of any of those who are with you in the room uh, in the comment section. And as you see others who have, who have checked in, please greet them and welcome them as well. As we move into a time of prayer, I want to con- uh, encourage you to continue to, to share your prayer requests as you are comfortable. And you can do that by typing those in the, in the comment section. We have a team of folks who wants to be in prayer in ministry with you. And so let us then go to God in in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us. We thank you for daily food, for health, for each breath we take. We thank you for the freedom to choose the paths we take in in our life. We thank you for family and friends and your love. God, when we consider that you have entrusted us so much, to, so much to our care, we can become overwhelmed. May we be worthy of your trust. May we be people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us. Give us courage to risk spreading your word. Give us courage to gamble loving those whom others think worthy only of hate. Give us courage to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us, God, to be faith-filled people and fill us with a desire to increase your goodness in our world. Make us people who share in both word and deed, the good news of Jesus' love. We pray for the church gathered today, both here and around the world, that it may encourage all who claim Christ to discover, develop, and use all their gifts and the grace available to them. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair. By your spirit working through us, bring healing to all those for whom we have prayed and help us walk faithfully in our path of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture lesson today comes from Galatians 5, verses 16 through 23. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts truly be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When I, when I became a, a father, um, one of the things that I hoped I would never do is fall into the trap of telling my kids how tough life was when I was growing up and and how much easier they have it today. Um, y'all know, you know the deal about that, right? You, you heard it from your parents, how they walked uphill in the snow to school with, without a jacket, using their socks as gloves, because, because their school was never canceled, right? But as a parent, it seems that we just, we just kind of fall into that, into that kind of conversation, don't we? My, my, uh, my youngest daughter, Lydia, is taking a couple of classes this summer from from Duman and and she was doing some school work um, the other night working online and and I got I got talking to her about how did we didn't have it so easy world book encyclopedia that's what I had at my home I said if you wanted if you wanted anything you had to look up the world bike encyclopedia if you needed more than that you had to go to the college library go through the card catalog spend hours looking through books through the microfiche of old newspapers and magazines, right? Some of you remember that. There was, there was no internet. There was no Google search. Well, I, well, I, got, to, I got to thinking about this, and, and there's another category that is just different these days. Um, different in a good way, I, I suppose, but, but kids today, they just don't run away, um, we ran away when, when we were kids, didn't we? Um, kids today don't, don't run away, it seems. Uh, but for us as kids running away, that was almost like a, a rite of passage, wasn't it? At some point, we, we ran away. Uh, I just care how many of y'all, one time or another, ran away from home? Go ahead and type that in the comment section. When, when you ran away, where you were going to run to? 
And again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for our children running away. And quite frankly, I wasn't even sure that I should, should mention it. Um, I, don't, I don't want my own children running away. But, but then I thought, shoot, I, I, can't even get, I can't even get Sophia to sleep in her own bed. There is no danger of her running away. <laughs> and I, 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 know you don't want, I know you don't want your kids running away, but I know that there are also some of you, you're also wondering... Are they ever going to leave? Are they ever going to go? But I, but I remember I was, I must have been six or seven years of age. I don't even remember what I was mad about, but I was mad, madder than I'd ever been. Probably I was mad at my mom for something, making me clean or dust or, or do my homework over again because it was messy. And I decided I had had enough. I was done. And I decided I was going to run away. I was never going to come back home. And so I went to my room and I got a little duffel bag. I got out, uh, uh, put a shirt in there, and I got a little stuffed, little stuffed animal warrus that I had on my bed. And I put that in the bag and I, I, I shoved in a couple of baseball cards. And I stomped down the stairs and I headed out the garage door. I was... I was done. I was leaving this prison of a place they called home. I was going off on my own. And I remember as I stepped out into the garage that it was, that it was starting to get a little bit dark. And, and as I stood in the garage, I remembered that I hadn't, brought a, I hadn't brought a flashlight. But I didn't think I could go back in the house now and look for one or, or ask Mom where, well, there, where there was one. I... I didn't know what to do. I, I remember it was, it was a little bit colder than I thought it would be. And, and so my steps got a little bit slower as I walked down the driveway. And the, the house looked so very far away from the end of our driveway. I got to the end. I wasn't exactly sure which way I should turn. Should I go left down towards the creek and into the fort that I had built in the woods? Or, or should I turn right and head up towards Uncle Bob's house. And so rather than make a, a quick irrational decision, I, I just sat down at the end of the driveway. And as I sat there, I was hoping that Mom would realize I was gone and that she would come out and that she would apologize for all the terrible things that she had done to me and the prison that she was making me live in. But she never did. <laughs> and so I looked back at the house wondering, where is she? And why is she not out here? And I, I look back to where the light from the living room window was so bright against the darkness outside, and I could, I could see a little smoke coming up out of the chimney where there was a fire burning downstairs, and I knew that my dad was lying on the couch watching TV. And it was then that I think I realized that, that life out here on the edge of the wilderness, maybe was not as good as I thought it would be. And actually, it was out in the cold darkness that I began to realize that life in my house was maybe not as bad as I, as I thought it was either. And I began to realize that, that, that running away wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It took me at age six... <laughs> probably all of about 15 minutes to learn that lesson from the edge of my driveway. And so I walked humbly back up the driveway into my home, through the garage door and back upstairs. And I unpacked my bag and I put my little walrus back on my bed and I got my jammies on and I went to bed right then. And I'll tell you, it was probably the best night's sleep I've ever I've ever had. I think a lot of us still live with that paradigm, though, don't we? We live in an environment that sustains us and shelters us and protects us and puts a roof over our head and, and provides, a, provides for us. And, and yet, even with all that, we sometimes think that we are better off out there on our own. Somehow we figure that we are better off trusting our own instincts. We, we somehow rationalize that I can do it better than you. I can live better than this, 
than this system I'm in. And so we run away and we head out on our own to the wild blue yonder, convinced that my stuff is better than this stuff that I'm putting up with. Sometimes we grow weary of the things around us and we wind up taking for granted that which actually sustains us and we become convinced that we don't need that anymore. And you can fill in the blank for whatever that in your life may be, but the that I want to talk about today is the local church. Because I know, I know that sometimes we get fed up with the local church, right? Or we get fed up with what many call institutional religion. And I've heard so many say, I, I love Jesus, I love God, but I have no need for the church. Here at Wright's Chapel, somebody gets mad about something I said. Or they get mad about something we did or didn't do. They get mad at the at the United Methodist Church, and they say, I don't need the church. I can do this on my own. And they pick up their bags and they run away. And I'll tell you, I've said, it, I've said it to myself when I've gotten frustrated, and all we want to do is, is run away from the church. And so my question for us today is, is does the church matter? Does the local church even matter? Does Wright's Chapel matter? Are we at 8063 Ladysmith Road even relevant in 2023? I mean, once you get past that, I want a place for my daughter to get married, or you get past it's nice to have a, a place for a funeral. Once we get past that, I mean, would it make any difference in our lives, any difference in our community, any difference in our world if we weren't here? I mean, what's important about Wright's Chapel? In the end, does what we do here really matter. And, and I just want to tell you that with all my heart and without blinking an eye, I believe it matters. I believe that what we do here, what we say here, how we live here, that it matters. I think that sometimes what happens is that we get so used to being here, we get so comfortable that we forget what it is like out there and we begin to take for granted the way that the local church, that this church sustains us, nurtures us, shelters us, provides for us. David Aikman, who was a bureau chief for Time Magazine in Beijing, China for many years, a really smart guy, has several doctorates, he wrote a book entitled Jesus in Beijing. And in the book, he, he talks about how China set out to try and discover what made the West so successful. And he records a statement from a Chinese social scientist, one who was indoctrinated in Maoism, who had carefully studied the West. And, and one of the things we were asked to look for, the scientist says, was, was what accounted for the success of the West all over the world. The Chinese want the success that America has had, and so they wanted to find the recipe to the, to the secret sauce. And the scientist said, we studied everything we could find. He said, from the historical, the political, the economical, the cultural perspective. At first we thought it was because you had more guns than we had, and, and that, that could make sense, right? Because bigger is badder is better, right? But that wasn't it. Then the scientist said, we, we thought that it was because you had the best political system, and then then we focused on your economic system. However, in the past 20 years, we realized that at the heart of your culture, what really makes you guys tick is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West, they concluded, has been so, has been so powerful. And I know that, that many of us may not agree with this, and I, I know that because a lot of us look at ourselves and look at our churches and we don't think that we're very good at that either. <laughs> I'm just telling you what Chinese social scientists are saying. They are saying that the secret sauce to the success of the West is our faith. And it's not that we're perfect, or not that we have it all figured out, but what they are saying is that our faith matters. The church matters. As a pastor who's been in the church all my life, I... 
I sometimes tend to forget this. At times, I need an objective person to sit back and remind, they, remind me that there is a value system here that just doesn't come naturally. In scientific studies done by the Chinese scientists looking in rural China where traveling evangelists have introduced the Christian faith, what they found is that opioid addiction goes down. Crime drops. Christian families grow wealthier than their neighbors. And it's not all about economics, but a group of scientists in China trying to figure out the secret sauce have figured out what we at times in our own, in our own communities tend to forget. The church matters. And I know that sometimes we get fed up, and when we do, we have a tendency to just want to run away, to break from the church and to go it alone. And we think, well, we don't need the church. We're just going to do what, what comes natural. And so let me spend a couple of minutes talking about where nature takes us. Once we get past the, the I've been to Colorado and seen the sunset, or once we get past I've been to the beach and watched the sun come up and how, how beautiful nature is. Once we get past that, then what we discover is that nature is violent. And nature is tough. Nature is an earthquake and cholera and Ebola and COVID and disease. Nature is a tsunami and a tornado. Nature is might makes right. Nature, friends, is survival of the fittest. Nature, friends, is dark and cold. And it's a tough place to go. Let me talk a minute about, about human nature. We think we want to go it alone. Human nature is racism. I'm different than you. I look different there. Therefore, I must be better than you because I am different. Human nature is slavery. And slavery, friends, is not just a thing of, of, of the past. Slavery of children, sex slavery is rampant in certain parts of the world, even in different parts and cities in our own country. Human nature is adultery. And yeah, we're, we're all against it, but it's so prevalent in society. Human nature is lying and cheating and stealing. Human nature is, is first come, first serve, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And so when we weigh in on our decision, am I for the church? Or am I better off alone? I want to tell you that the church matters more than we can imagine. We in the church hold the teaching that says that we can overcome the standard that was put upon us by nature. We hold the teaching that says we can do better than that. We don't have to succumb to nature. No, we can, be, we can be transformed. And the Apostle Paul speaks to this when he writes to the church at Galatia. And the church at Galatia was going through some struggles, and there were some folks there in the church who thought that maybe it would be better to just, to just run away from the church, better to just try to go it alone. And so Paul lays out for them the difference between doing things that come natural and then doing things when you lean into this thing called faith. So Paul talks to them about the acts of the flesh. Or the Greek word could be translated human nature. And they are obvious, says Paul. They are obvious because we see them all the time. We see these acts of nature and we say, oh yeah, that's, that's obvious. My neighbor does that. Acts of the flesh. They are obvious because we see them when we look in the mirror. Or we, or we think or we feel some urge to do them and we say... Yeah, that's, that's a natural reaction. And so Paul names that which is part of human nature. Sexual immorality, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, or sorcery, which, interesting enough, the Greek word is drug use. Jealousy, a part of human nature, which is why it is so hard for me and for us to celebrate other success. It's, it's natural. Rage, selflessness, drunkenness, and the like, which means the list is not complete. And so we read this list and we realize that this is why we need laws 
to keep us from doing at times that which comes natural. For, for yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I would cheat. I would lie if I didn't think I would get caught, right? Sometimes we forget that when we pack up our bag and run away and just go to where nature takes us, it can get very dark very quick. And it turns rough and tough and chaotic and cold. But Paul in this passage also says there is a solution. We don't have to live like that, for we can live with the fruits of the Spirit. Let me tell you about the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit is what gets activated within us when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. The fruit of the Spirit is what God instills in us when we choose to take up and take on the life of Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is what activates the moral compass. The Spirit mobilizes inner courage. The Spirit liberates us from the way of nature. Paul says the Spirit is love, joy, kindness, peace, faithfulness. Let's talk about peace. Because we can go where nature will take us, but it, but it won't include peace. Let's talk about an affair, right? An affair, right? That's where nature will take us. And yet I have never known anyone who has been involved, involved in an affair and who has had peace. And I'll tell you, because of my work, I know a lot of folks who have had affairs. But the one thing they do not have, not one, no one, is at peace. Peace doesn't come from nature. It comes from the Spirit. We ask, does the message of the church matter? Are you kidding me? Of course it matters. It's the most important message of the world. As Christians, with, we are charged with and stewards of not only the message of eternal life, but we are stewards of a message of a better life now. A better life, not just in the future, but a better life right now. And you and I have a choice. And we can, we can pack up our bags and go the way of nature, or we can choose the message of, of the church, which is going to take us in a totally different way. Does the church matter? Are you kidding me? We, we hold and carry the message of a better way of life. And, and yes, we run the risk, and we are sometimes guilty of self-righteousness, and we have to guard against that. But let's be perfectly clear. We have always thought that we had a better way. In the first century... Christians said the way of Jesus Christ is a better way than your Roman culture way. It's not just equal. It's not just one of many different equal ways. No, we believe that a culture where a man can keep a woman as a piece of property is not ideal. We think that there is a better way. We think that a culture where a father can just sell off his daughter for misbehaving is not the best way. We think there is a better way. We think that when you look at another person eyeball to eyeball, and we see them as a creation made in the divine image of God, we think that that is a better way than looking down on someone else as being less than you are. We think that there is a better way for marriage. We think, husbands, you ought to love your wife as Christ loved the church. We think that that is a better way of doing marriage than the way nature would have us do it. Of course we think we have a better way. Can that lead us to self-righteousness? Sure it can. And we have to fight against that. But make no mistake, the message of this church, the message of this church, is that there is a better way. Who else is going to say some of this stuff unless the church does? The church says, forgive. Nature says, take revenge. Get even. No, the church says, try, try forgiveness. But they haven't paid me back yet. I know, the church says, forgive. You see, that, that's not natural. The church says that when people in the world tell you that there are some people who have little or no value, we in the church say, no way, that, that's crazy talk. They have extraordinary value, equal value. In fact, Jesus says the last will be first. The church says, love your enemies. 
Pray for them. But that's not natural. Paul says, exactly. Friends, all that is key in life is encapsulated in the message of the local church. We hold and proclaim a message, not just of eternal life, but a way to a better life. And I, and I want to suggest and encourage us, friends, that when that message disappears from the world or from our culture or from our community, it can very quickly become a cold, dark place. For more than 175 years in Caroline County, we at Wright's Chapel have not bowed to what culture says. We have rather, and we will continue to proclaim that there is a better way. And I tell you, friends, with all my heart, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. That the local church is the hope of this country. The local church is the hope of this community. And I want to encourage you, friends, that when you get frustrated, and when you want to run away from institutional religion because of all of our shortcomings, or you want to run away because you're mad at the preacher, or you're mad at Sean, or you're mad at some decision that the church makes and it isn't going your way. I just pray that you give your church another shot. And I pray that when you, when you want to run away, that you'll slow down and think again and get engaged. For there is something about the church, something about this church, that we deliver a message that is so important. And we want you and need you to be a part of proclaiming that message and all that we are doing in this place. Thank you for all you do in the name of Jesus. Thank you for all you do in the name of this church. We are servants of Christ, making disciples and transforming the world because of you. Peace and amen. Again, let me just say thank you for all the gifts you give to the life of our church that just allow us to do all of the things uh, that, that we do. Uh, for, for the ministries that take place here, for uh, the community that is served uh, through here, uh, for the people who will never come here in worship on a Sunday, but are relying upon the church. I thank you. For the gifts that you send in, you text in, you mail in, it makes a difference. Thank you for what you do. And now let me share this benediction with you and Clay will lead us into a song of praise. That we might go forth into this world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good and render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint hearted and support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor every person, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the powers of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Nature and all created things.